We are live right now. Um, good morning, buenos dias, bon dia, depending on where you are connected. It is a big pleasure to be connected with people from Europe and Latin America as part of our efforts between EVPA and Latin Pacto, both venture financial networks focused on promoting significant impact. So welcome to our webinar. We have launched uh, our first poll, so we appreciate that you can answer the poll. It's still running. Um, we will start in one minute. We are waiting for more participants to join us. So now we will start. Um, once again, buenos dias to all of us that are joining us today. As I mentioned before, it is a big pleasure to be connected with people from Europe and Latin America as part of our efforts to, to, to improve in impact with our sister network in Europe, EVPA, the European Venture Philanthropy Association and Latin Pacto. My name is Carolina Suarez and I am the CEO of Latin Pacto, the newly established Latin American network of philanthropists and social investors. Um, we are proud to be here today with EVPA and we want to give you a warm virtual welcome to this webinar in which we will present the Corporate Social Alliance and the European Corporate Social Initiative that EVPA is promoting with more than 70 corporate social investors uh, along Europe seeking to advance in their uh, corporate social investment impact. Um, so let's start with the, with the agenda. Uh, we will present um, this agenda uh, that I'm sharing right now. So I will start with a brief introduction about Latin Pacto and we will share some data about the importance of corporate investors in Latin America. Then we will have the privilege to listen to our EVPA colleagues, Steven Sernels, the chair at EVPA, uh, who has been leading the Corporate Social Initiative Sophie Fajou, the head of the Corporate Initiative Development and the Country Manager in France at EVPA, and Karen Heitman, the Corporate Initiative Manager at EVPA. Uh, they will present the Corporate Social Initiative and the four Corporate Strategic Alignments, and also they will present the key findings that they have found over the time uh, with this initiative that guards the most important European uh, corporate social investors. And once our colleagues finish, we will open for our uh, Q&A session to answer your questions, the colleagues, the audience questions that you will have regarding the, the corporate social initiative and or the alignments. Then we will invite uh, Guillaume Bodescal and Lore Guille to share about um, their experiences and as corporate social investors. Guillaume and Lauren are leaders in Latin America and in Europe, and they will share with us their learnings, their experiences as catalysts of these businesses, and we will understand how both are applying and, and building a mutual understanding and collaboration with the company's practices. So we will have a, a dialogue with Lore and Guillaume, and we will open again for a question and, 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 
and answer session. So please use the chat uh, to to answer to ask your questions, and we will answer live with them. So this is the the agenda that we have for today. It will be 19 minutes, and welcome again to this webinar. So let me start to to give a, a brief introduction of Latin Impacto. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, that Impacto is uh, our Latin American venture philanthropy network. It's a, an asset network that arises after almost two years of due diligence, and we are proud to follow the role models of our sister networks in Europe, EVPA, and Asia, AVPN. Uh, we are a community of philanthropists and social investors, and our aim is to connect and mobilize capital, and we understand by capital, human, intellectual, and financial capital, to achieve more and lasting positive social and environmental impact by promoting the exchange of knowledge and by facilitating connections for graded collaboration and co-investment. Um, also, we are an independent network. We are part of a global movement. So we connect to the largest community of global in social investors, more than a thousand organizations who are members of EVPA and AVPN, plus those engaged in Africa by AVPA. And, and as I mentioned, we are proud to apply and adapt to the Latin American context. All the learnings from a network like EVPA with more than 16 years of uh, an extraordinary trajectory. Um, uh, you can see here on this slide what it is the value that we are offering to the Latin American ecosystem. So first, we aim to connect the entire um, continuum of capital from philanthropic grants to the full market rate return impact investment, including talent and intellectual capital. We also seek to connect providers of capitals across all silos, from foundations to corporates, investors, family offices, professional services, academia, and um, public sectors. Uh, third, uh, we promote the most effective investment approaches to achieve impact first. So we encourage a rigorous social deployment of the catalytic capital, following the principles of venture philanthropy or investing for impact in order to generate significant social impact approaches and those tools from private equity and venture capital. Sorry for the dog. Um, <laughs> Finally, but not least significant, we connect to the largest community of global social investors. And so we are independent network, as I mentioned before in our previous slide, but we are part of a global movement and we connect to the largest community of global social investors. So our ultimate goal of Latin Impact is creating a, a more positive social and environmental impact to the facilitation of connections, sharing information and best practices, and mobilizing more capital towards impact. Uh, here's our, our principles that we share with our sister networks in Europe, Asia, and Africa. But please let me focus on the two of them that I found critical for, for this webinar. So the, the first principle is diverse types of investors. So we are a, a unique network in Latin America, and we carry a diversity type of investors, breaking down silos and encouraging collaboration across them, as you can see here. So we are building a, a vibrant and high impact social investment community across Latin America to improve the effectiveness of our members along the region. So you can see how we can connect corporates, foundations, academia, investors, um, family offices, government, professional services firms, all of them providers of capital and how we are connecting and attracting them to multiply the, the social and environment uh, impact. Mm. Here is, it is my favorite slide, and actually we will explain them in detail uh, in this webinar, is how we can um, support the continuum of capital. So we are looking forward to leveraging a range of investment practices from philanthropic grants to the full market rate return, impact investment, including talent and intellectual capital. So we understand that investors can leverage practices through supporting the needs of social purpose organizations at different growth stages and to structure their portfolio to the maximum impact. So this is our one of the most important guiding principles and that we will explain in this in this webinar and here we can see how 
Fundación FEMSA and Mobilis uh, are working across this continent of capital, how they are moving and applying it in their strategies. So um, it's just to show you here how the corporate sector and the corporate investment is important in Latin America. You can see here from, it is a, 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 a graphic from the Global Philanthropy Report in 2016 and how the corporate social actors represent the largest part of institutional philanthropy. And there is a growing identity of interest between companies, social responsibility strategies, and, and you can see how we are working and, and the difference between in different regions. Here's Latin America and how it represents 50% of the philanthropic sector in Latin America. Uh, this research was, and, and, and this, this findings, um, they were defined by the latest uh, research um, that was uh, released last February. Uh, it is a report that was led by the Universidad Pacifico del Perú, uh, the Association of Corporate and Family Foundations in Colombia, in Chile at the Universidad Adolfo Ibáñez, in, San Andre, in, San, in Argentina the Universidad de San Andrés, and in Mexico Alternativas en Capacidades. And you can see how corporate philanthropy is the fastest growing sector in Latin America. Uh, over 50% of corporate foundations, as you can see here, in between the difference between corporate, independent, and family foundations, and how this movement has been growing since the 2000s. Um, and when we ask the social purpose organizations, 40% of them acknowledge corporates as their main sponsor and income provider. So we can see here that uh, corporate foundations are going fast, but uh, other corporate impact vehicles uh, such as accelerators, incubators, and impact funds are not growing at the same at the same rate. So the idea is how we can continue promoting the corporate social initiative and how we can uh, promote a balance. Uh, among different uh, corporate vehicles. So um, here I just want to highlight, uh, we will, uh, Lori will present a case about Latin America FEMSA, one of the most important foundations in the region, but also I just want to present Fondo Valley uh, because it's, it's not common to find corporate funds as I mentioned before. So Fondo Valley was created by Valley, a global mining company and the world's largest producer of iron. They are a member of our strategic advisory board and it's, it's the way how they are uh, working across the continent of capital through different vehicles. And you can see here the Valley Foundation that it supports donations with various projects, particularly on health, education, and job and income creation and generation. But also you can find Fondo Valley, it is the, the venture philanthropy arm of the company and how they are contributing for more than $40 million, making it one of the top 10 founders of the Amazon conservation actions in the world. And also you will find the, the, the Valley Nature Reserve and the, uh, and the Valley Technology here. So you will see how they are integrating the continuum of capital and how they are trying to coordinate all these initiatives um, through the continuum of capital. So I am glad to present that and I'm happy to continue the dialogue with uh, Fondo Valley that is part of our, our strategic advisory board. And just to mention two accelerators that, uh, as I mentioned, we'll have two main accelerators in the region, but we have two, Progreso X in Guatemala, part of the cement company, and also Aceladora from Corona Company, one of the tiles company in, in, in the region, not only in Colombia, but also operating in, in, the, in different countries in Latin America, but also in the US. So it's just to, to have an overview of how, what is happening in Latin America, what we are seeing, and, and the importance of having a this initiative and how we can implement together with our system that was this kind of initiatives in, in, in Latin America. So uh, as with these brief words, I would like to welcome Steven Cernels, uh, the chair of the EVPA, um, the European Venture Philanthropy Association, that will give us some words and, and welcome Steven and happy to be here with you. Thank you, Caroline. You can all hear me? That's yes, we fine. can. Very good. Impressive numbers, Caroline, and a very nice example. So uh, to the audience, uh, we're very happy to be with you and, and share some examples of Europe, but likewise, enter in a dialogue and learn from you, because I think uh, mutually we can uh, indeed uh, exchange a lot of experience. But before I hand over to my colleagues, let me just uh, sketch a little bit the, the history and, and the context. So we as EVPA, we exist 16 years. 
but about a couple of years ago, three, four years ago, we started a corporate initiative. It started very small. We had a handful of members um, and it was, let's say, in the fringes of all the activities of EVPA. But today it is one of the main programs of EVPA with around 70 members, a dedicated team, uh, full research, and um, also rather successful annual conference. Now, if you would ask me why this success, there is always a kind of serendipity, I would say. I think timing was right. And why is timing right? Because we notice, and probably you notice as well with your corporations, that profit without purpose is gradually becoming unacceptable. Companies are embracing purpose or striving for shared value. But while they do so, they figure out that on their journey, it's a long and quite complex endeavor. It takes many years, many stakeholders, and they also find out that if they want to be successful, that they have to step into an ecosystem where they're not the only ones, but they team up with other corporates, they team up with other social actors and other policy makers. And I think that's where, let's say, at least in Europe, we've seen that in order to address this complex long journey, this ecosystem participation, many businesses have re-evaluated and revalued, in fact, the role corporate foundations play and started to investigate how can they strategically align. And as my colleagues will tell you, uh, in recent years, and it's, it's very nascent, in the last two, three years, we've seen many corporates also starting corporate impact funds. Um, we've seen corporates starting corporate social accelerators. We've seen companies starting corporate social businesses, and so on. That's what we call corporate social investors. So the presentation itself, I hope, will show you that corporate social investors have become a vital and crucial piece of the puzzle in this bigger journey towards purpose where many corporates engage themselves. Many of the things we're going to say are captured in an article we published in May. It has many thousands of downloads, uh, close to 10,000, I think, right now. And by the end of the year, we will also publish advanced research how these corporate social investors and corporations come together to align for better purpose. Let me stop here. Again, thanks for having us and hand over to my colleague, Sophie. Thank you, Stephen. Just to mention to the audience that you can make your questions using the chat, the Q&A chat. Sophie, please. Good morning, uh, everybody. Good morning. All right. So, uh, as uh, Stephen explained uh, four or five years ago, we started this uh, corporate initiative as we rapidly identified that the private sector had to play a role to, uh, to reach the SDGs by uh, 2030 and fund the social innovation that the, so the sector needs. So on this slide, you see the, uh, the different pillars of the resources that EVPA developed for the four, for the, for the four past years. Uh, first, we uh, uh, build the community uh, to make sure that the, the corporate members connect and engage with a group of like-minded peers. Um, second, second, uh, we want to make sure that we develop expertise through our knowledge uh, center. And uh, so we build the expertise around the corporate social investing uh, through uh, interviewing our members, conducting uh, uh, group uh, research and uh, to produce uh, a toolkit uh, for the corporate uh, practitioners. Uh, thirdly, uh, we organize the, the, the peer learning so that uh, uh, corporate members can uh, learn from each other, from the lessons, but also from the failures, uh, and really share the, the best practices. Last but not least, we give some guidance. Uh, we give some guidance uh, through training uh, events uh, to reflect on our uh, research work. So. Uh, 
who are our members? Uh, you see all those logos uh, on, the, on the slides, uh, many multinationals, around uh, 80 uh, European corporates, uh, social investors, and they are on in the search of the most effective way to generate high social impact and leveraging strategically their corporate resources. That's uh, a bit our motto of the corporate initiative. This is our ambition. And uh, our objective is uh, it that becomes the norm by 2030. So looking at the logo, you may wonder, but to, who, to whom we talk to? As Stephen mentioned, uh, we pay a specific attention to uh, those impact structures within the corporate organization. So um, we call them uh, corporate social investors. As a fact, those corporate social investors are not the, the corporate social responsibility team. Uh, it's, um, they are actually complementing what the, comp the corporate social uh, responsibility team are doing. So what are they, corporate social investors? They are corporate foundations, corporate impact accelerators, social businesses, shareholder foundations, corporate impact funds, and uh, those team, they have a key role in creating social impact with business relevance. And uh, their common goal is to advance their impact individually and collectively when the corporate set up a different impact structure. The beauty, uh, the beauty of those corporate social investors are as follows. One, they are uh, f first, first, let's uh, remind that those corporate social investors are the unique vantage point between non-profit and business and in the current uh, situation crisis we see how important uh, how important um, uh, it is um, how important those uh, those impact structure uh, are because uh, more and more um, the the non-profit and, and the business tend tend to converge in the context of the corporate organization. So what are the unique advantages of those corporate social investors? One, they are long-term. Uh, they have a vision to spot the transformative social solutions with potential business value. Two, they are bold. They are taking, uh, they are taking risk. Uh, we'll come to that in a second. And they can push the boundaries of the company we will have a, a number of examples with our panelists. Three, they are risk taker. They can take, take risk that uh, no other player can take to develop pilot experimentation for social, social innovation. And again, we'll have a, a very good example, uh, namely with, uh, with Renault. Uh, four, scaling. They have a scaling capacity when collaborating with a parent company. And we'll see that it's uh, one of the core topic of this uh, strategic alignment question. Five, potentially they can play a catalytic role in uh, the inclusive business journey of the company. Um, so um, the strategic alignment question actually between a corporate social investor and the affiliated company actually helps to unlock the advantages. And uh, therefore, the strategic alignment question, it's a very good way to think strategically about the collaboration in a win-win manner between the corporate social uh, investor and the affiliated company and see how they can uh, generate higher impact, create and create a business value uh, at the same time. Uh, Caro, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, indeed, on that note, I'm excited to share with you our strategic alignment framework, because what we notice is that, that there is not just one way to align for a corporate social investor with the affiliated company. So what we found out through uh, more than 40 interviews with practitioners, but also with experts on the field, is that we see, in fact, four different ways how a corporate social investor can align with the company. 
And the decision on what kind of alignment they choose primarily depends also on how they look at social impact. So what are the impact objectives? Um, on the one hand, we have some corporate social investors that want to generate impact by primarily focusing on really the final beneficiaries, independent from what the company does. And here, what we'll notice is non-material and thematic alignment. And I'll introduce those um, a bit more elaborately uh, afterwards. But on the other hand, we also have corporate social investors who want to generate impact directly through their own programs uh, on the final beneficiaries. But at the same time, they also want to leverage that relationship that they have with the company to positively influence either the related company to uh, move further on their own sustainability and inclusive business path, or that want to also uh, use that relationship to move the entire industry at large towards a more uh, sustainable path. And depending on this here, we see more the industry and business alignment. So let's take a first look at what non-material alignment is. And here, what we uh, define on material alignment, uh, when corporate social investors align their operations with non-material areas of the business. So for example, with the geographical presence, with the aim of enhancing their ability to create social change. Interesting in here is that the corporate social investor really aligns their operations. So the mission and the core focus areas thereby remains unrelated to the company or the industry. An example here is the JTI Foundation. So the JTI Foundation's mission is to help less privileged people and victims of natural man-made disasters improve their quality of life. So they operate in the disaster context, which has nothing to do with their affiliated company, JT International or JTI, a global tobacco manufacturer. But although their mission is unrelated to what the company does, they still made the deliberate choice to align on the geography. So the foundation operates in those geographic areas where also the company is present. And the reason is that the foundation noticed if a disaster occurs, that gives them an advantage to reach out to employees on the ground that work in those um, national offices to ask for instance for expertise on the local infrastructure, to have someone who also speaks the local language, they can potentially uh, reach out for support if they need a car or phones or some assets. So in that way, by choosing this non-material alignment and aligning their operation with the geographical presence of the company, the JTI Foundation can also uh, operate more effectively in these disaster contexts. Um, now, I also described some, some impact benefits and business relevance. I won't describe all of them, but just to give you a bit of a feeling. So here, again, the benefit for corporate social investors that they can have this independent mission and focus on issues that they feel are really socially relevant, but at the same time, they can access corporate assets whenever it is instrumental for them. Looking at the business side more, for them, it can also be um, um, valuable to have a corporate foundation or a corporate social investor in general that focuses on areas where they really have a strong philanthropic concern or the moral responsibility to act. So something that is really beyond the business scale. And that can, uh, for instance, help employees also to be really proud of the work that they do. The next alignment type that we unraveled was the thematic alignment. Um, and here what we see is that some corporate social investors, they align their mission or core focus areas with social issues that are materially important to the company. So those could be, for example, sustainable development goals. It could also be uh, themes or issues that are important for the company as part of their sustainability um, strategy. Um, but here the important thing is that the corporate social investors have the aim to create a stronger coherence between their social impact and the companies. So what they do is they take a theme, but then they take it from a societal and look at it from a societal angle. An example here would be the Rabobank Foundation. The Rabobank Foundation is related to a Dutch uh, consumer, but also food and agribank. And their mission is around supporting cooperatives of smallholder farmers in developing countries to become more professionalized, efficient, and ultimately self-reliant. And that mission of supporting cooperative is also something that is deeply rooted within the core of the Rabobank, which has originally, or which was originally set up to serve cooperatives, but even up to today uh, supports um, uh, large cooperatives in, in developing countries. 
Yet what the foundation then does is they look at the stream, as I was saying, from a societal perspective. So they try to identify where are the biggest needs. In this case, they decided to focus on the smallholder uh, cooperatives that are not commercially relevant yet and, and uh, support them in developing countries. So what are some impact benefits here by choosing a thematic alignment? Well, for a corporate foundation like the Rabobank Foundation, but also others, that's an advantage of using also now the company's knowledge and expertise that they developed on the shared theme. So in that case, they might be able to benefit by reaching out to corporate employees for uh, mentoring, for volunteering, and really uh, tapping into all this vast knowledge that the company has developed. It's also an opportunity to resonate better with the employees. So because it's something that is also has a relationship with what the bank or the company does, it's also something that employees can better understand. On the business side, um, yeah, also for the company or the bank, it can be interesting uh, to have a corporate foundation that can really provide a new angle of looking at the scheme. So something that has nothing to do with the business relevance, but making them aware about what are the other developments in society that are going on, where are beneficiaries, how are they looking and dealing with these uh, social challenges on a day-by-day -day basis to help them, for instance, also to think more about how they can develop a more impact-driven strategy for themselves. The third alignment type that we unravel was industry alignment. And here what we see is that corporate social investors align their mission and are their core focus areas with social issues that are related to the corporate industry. Uh, and here what they would like to do is to really advance best practices or set new industry-wide standards to not only move the affiliated company further towards sustainability and inclusiveness, but the entire industry. An example here uh, would be the Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture. As the name already suggests, it's something that is also connected to the industry of Syngenta, a global agricultural company. But the foundation looked at the industry at large and tried to identify what are the most pressing societal challenges that are related to this uh, industry that are not sufficiently addressed yet, neither by corporate actors nor by other civil society actors. And this is where the Sangenta Foundation defined their mission, and in particular around helping to accelerate the inclusive growth of agriculture by supporting resource poor, poor small farmers in developing countries become more professional and self-sustainable growers. So here they're really trying to support these smallholder farmers, which are not commercially relevant yet, but that have um, an opportunity to become more professionalized and self-sustainable in the future. If you look at the impact benefits for a corporate social investor to align on the industry, it also gives them the opportunity to not only, uh, again, use the vast uh, expertise and know-how of the companies, but it can also be helpful to mobilize the relevant stakeholders. So the name here can also really help to open doors and to bring all the relevant actors together on a table to think about collaborative innovations that can really set higher standards for the innovation uh, for the industry. An example here is also uh, what previously was the CNA Foundation, now the Laudis Foundation. They, for instance, founded a collaborative platform around uh, scaling um, circular business models for the fashion industry. And here they had CNA as one of the corporate partners joining this initiative, but they also were able to reach out to Adidas, to Zalando, and many others to come and join this, this collaborative initiative. Um, looking at the business relevance, yeah, for the business also uh, can be a value to have a corporate social investor like this who can also provide them some information on what are, for instance, these pre-commercial uh, innovations that are happening that might be too risky for a company to invest in or, or too bold, but it can be invaluable information to them to understand what else is happening. And also, of course, what role can they take to address that in the future? Uh, last but not least, we also have business alignment, where corporate social investors align their mission with the company's purpose or long-term inclusive business strategy. And here the aim is really to invest in social innovations that can potentially be scaled through the company's value chain. Um, one organization that also participated in the research was uh, Renault Mobilis, so they would be a great example here. But since they're already here, um, I'm also keen to present you the case of Danone Ecosystem. Um, and Danone Ecosystem is uh, related to Danone. 
Um, but their mission is to co-create inclusive business solutions that answer local challenges through the professional empowerment of vulnerable stakeholders in Danone's value chain. So what Danone Ecosystem does is they look at what are the most vulnerable also um, um, beneficiaries that are related to the value chain of the company. And they work together with local subsidiaries as well as NGOs on really developing these inclusive business solutions. So they work really from the bottom up. If they're uh, successful also improving, um, um, uh, successfully showing their proof of concept, then of course there's also huge opportunities that these innovations and business solutions could potentially be scaled through the company and thereby reach a broader audience and beneficiary groups. Uh, if you look at the impact benefits of business alignment, yeah, one of the strong advantages here is that corporate social investors can really utilize every aspect of the company's value chain because there's such a strong link also with what the company does. Looking at the business relevance, also something that ties in back to what Sophie was already sharing, is they can really also help to uh, catalyze the development of new novel solutions um, and show also the company what else is possible beyond uh, the scope that they're currently looking into to really help them uh, catalyze on their inclusive business journey. Um, last but not least, um, also just to recap, uh, we have uh, several um, resources available at EVPA where we share more information about the strategic alignment framework, the article that Stephen also referred to, which was published recently in Stanford Social Innovation Review, uh, but we also have some great case studies um, and an infographic introduction. So for everyone who's interested, I can also just advise to visit our website and take a look at all the available materials that we have. And last but not least, um, but also just a quick reminder that we have a conference coming up September 3rd and 4th, which is the C Summit, a conference that was specifically developed for corporate foundations, corporate social uh, incubators and impact funds. And due to the current situation, we're of course also going online. So we have an online participation rate. So for everyone who's interested also in connecting with more European actors and hearing more about um, yeah, relevant topics for specifically corporate social investors, um, we hope to, to see you at the CISA Summit. Thank you. Thank you, Steven, Sophie, and Caroline for this strong presentation about the corporate social initiative and the alignment. So now, is it time to open for questions? I have a question for Pablo. So he's asking here when there is a thematic industry or business alignment, is there a risk of real or perceived corporate profit motivation with the beneficiaries of the foundation? You can also see the question, Sophie and Stephen and Caroline. So maybe he's talking if we have any specific alignment uh, how you can manage with the with the corporate profit motivation? Is, I understand if I understand well the question, Pablo is. But are you asking? Uh, yeah, I think so. The more you also move towards business alignment, of course, there are also more um, more direct or potential business benefits. Um, However, what we see with thematic alignment, what a lot of corporate social investors do is they really look at the theme, but then, as I was saying, from a uh, societal angle. So they operate around beneficiary groups or social issues that are related to this theme, but that are not related to what the company does. So in the case of the Rabobank Foundation, they really work in these developing countries with um, cooperatives that are far from being commercially interesting to the bank, and they really try to support them there. What we see with industry alignment, of course, is also, um, again, more of a potentially indirect benefit for the business. Uh, but again, they're really trying to focus on those areas where they feel like the industry needs another push to advance, where the corporate actors alone are not sufficiently addressing the problem yet. And one of the um, themes could be, as I was also saying in the case of CNA Foundation, working on collaborative solutions. So really trying to address those points um, where they can really help to advance the, the industry from a societal point of view. Yeah. And of course, also, depending a bit on the country in Europe, there are very strict tax and legal constraints. So you cannot just, um, let's say, provide and create profit or support for profit of the company. That's just not accepted. So that's why um, what we very often see the last couple of years, if you move into 
business alignment that you start to incubate a different structure than your foundation. You start to incubate an accelerator or like Repsol did, one of the big oil and gas companies that uh, make this statement that by 2050 they would be CO2 neutral. They had a corporate foundation, but they also incubated a 50 million corporate impact fund to source new innovations in energy creation and so on and so forth. So the tax and legal boundaries push you to think creatively about new structures in between the foundation and the corporation. Yes, we don't have the same restriction in the Latin American countries, but if, for example, in the US and some European countries, there is a, a restriction. So here another question from Ricardo. He is asking what are the risks or benefits to have a national reach, uh, how they can improve reputation of the, of the company. Um, because he thinks that the most important reason and, and the motivation for the companies to, to have any specific alignment is to improve reputation in accordance with the McKinsey report. So what do you think about that? Uh, do you think that it's true that the companies are trying to, to have any specific alignment to improve their reputation? Or is... It's a difficult question and it's a very good question because um, it is absolutely true that still today um, the reputation, what we call the brand equity of the company, uh, can be enhanced by doing good. But what we see happening more and more is it's only about enhancing your brand equity and putting your logo on a doing good slide that this is not sustainable, <laughs> that this is short term and that if the company is not walking the talk, then sooner or later it will come back as a boomerang. So more and more companies start to realize that if they not genuinely in line they're doing good and they're doing business around a common purpose that it's short-lived and quite dangerous but you're right in reality we also see this still happening for sure yes any other comment sophie caroline and also because i, I mix both questions our question is what is the risk or benefits to have a national reach as a corporate business with a diverse sort of alignments, but a local reach as a corporate foundation. So what is, I think the, the question at the end is, we should have any specific alignment that we, you can mix them being a, a, local, a local player. Uh, yeah, we definitely see also that uh, corporate foundations or other corporate social investors mix their type of alignment. Of course, the more locally you focus, the more um, maybe tailored solutions you can provide. So we see, for example, Vodafone is a nice example. They have 27 corporate foundations that are all national foundations. So each one really serving their own uh, focus areas. Uh, but at the same time, they also have uh, um, corporate foundation that coordinates all of these efforts. So yeah, there definitely can also be a different alignment types that coexist next to each other. It can also be different geographical focus that coexist next to each other. Yeah, and just to complement, uh, I think that uh, we, yes, uh, uh, another example, Vinci with uh, 25, uh, the company, uh, airport uh, management company uh, with 25 uh, foundation around the world. And uh, they found it very, really powerful and efficient to have a, a global uh, strategy, uh, yet uh, they think uh, local. So it's uh, think global, act locally, and uh, they, they think that uh, sticking to uh, the strategic thematic alignment uh, they have is uh, is more um, uh, than really um, pursuing an exclusively a local strategy. Okay, and two more questions Some from Marcia Suarez from Fondo Valley, the example that I, that I already presented, is do you think that the foundation or it gets more extracted internally when it acts with a logic of business or industry alignment? So what do you see the different alignments and what do you prefer, industry or business alignment and which one give more value to the company mm. well i don't think we, what we try to put forward is not 
the one is better than the other. It's more the complementarity. Um, again, take IKEA. IKEA has one of the biggest foundations in the world. And what they did recently is to readdress the thematics uh, within the IKEA foundation um, around inclusive economy and circular economy in order to better capture what the company is doing. So they are creating at arm's length a full ecosystem where the IKEA company can better thrive and, and act. But they also found that the IKEA Foundation can only do so much, in this case very much as well, because uh, there are tax and legal constraints and they have this much bigger picture long-term view. So they started IKEA Social Entrepreneurs very recently. And IKEA Social Entrepreneurs is in between the corporate foundation and the corporation. And IKEA Social Entrepreneurs, they're collaborating with IKEA Company on certain aspects of the value chain. So rather than saying the one is bringing better value than the other towards the company, we try to unpack the different and complementary value they each bring to the company. And, and actually, uh, each company choose the uh, type of alignment that best fits uh, a norm of uh, criteria, which is uh, uh, the management, the, the history of the group, uh, the type of leadership, the, the, the uh, a leaders who is and has a vision at a certain time. So it's a very much, um, um, it's very, it's the story of each uh, corporate organization, which strategic alignment uh, fits better, really. Yes, and we have more questions that maybe we can ask after the presentation from Guillaume and, and, and Lori because they will present how they, they will manage these different alignments and how they are moving forward and applying them. So let me introduce Lorena, eh, Lorena eh, the Executive Director of FEMSA Foundation. She is an entrepreneur who has dedicated her life to corporate social responsibility. Um, after leading the social responsibility of Cinepolis and Fundación Cinepolis in Mexico for more than 14 years, she was the that they, um, to be the, 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 the executive director at Fundación FEMSA since last April. Uh, and she has a she's engineer and a master's degree in public policy and administration from the Tech de Monterrey, and also some studies at the Kennedy School of the Government at Harvard. So, and we also have Guillaume Madascal uh, with a long track record in both finance and new mobility services with 10 years ago he created a csr relation function inside the investors relations department at renault group and then he worked for six years on developing solutions to adapt renault cars to mobility services such as car sharing and she joined the csr department two years ago to be in charge of mobilis invest that he will present in detail right now so it is a pleasure that you are here with us uh, Guillaume and, and, and Lore, that you can share with us your experience working with these different kind of alignments and how you are improving your management and giving more value added to the, to the corporation and to the uh, system. So, Lore, the, the floor is yours and you can pass your own slides. And thank you for asking also the, for, for the poll and for answering it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Caro, and uh, it's a pleasure to share this uh, webinar with, with all, all of the panelists and to thank you to all the audience. Um, uh, I would love to share with you what we stand for, the bridges that we have built at Fundación FEMSA and the social value that we have created with a focus of the topic that we are talking about. Uh, just for you to know, FEMSA, we are a Mexican company. We were founded over 130 years ago. Um, over 300,000 people work in the country, in the, in the company, and we have operations almost in all Latin America. Our operations, uh, we have many divisions. We are like a holding of, uh, of companies. Uh, we own almost 50% of Coca-Cola uh, FEMSA, and then we have another business unit, uh, FEMSA Comercio, Strategic Businesses, and the Brewery. We started, um, uh, over a hundred years ago, uh, 
and something that is really interesting is that we have a full story of shared value. We, since we were created, we truly believe that we are here to create economic value, but also shared value. And just a proof of that is that uh, we founded uh, in 1890, SCIF, which was founded to promote the education and economic development of the breweries, employees, and their families. And then in 1918, we began offering medical services to our employees in our clinics and home visits, even before the Mexican Institute of Social Security was funded by the government. Then uh, 15 years later, the Tech of Monterey, uh, which is ranked one of, of the uh, leading private universities, actually the 28th private university in the world and number one in Mexico, was founded by our founder, showing the commitment to education. So everything that you are seeing in this in this list, list of how we started providing housing even before the government founded the Institute of the National Housing Fund for Workers. Um, and then we created the first one of the first museums here in Monterey in our brewery. So we have a, a, something that is just a continuum of commitment through the years. And in 2008, we created our foundation. Uh, our mission is to impact people, people and communities through social investment projects for sustainability. And as you can see in this diagram, we uh, truly believe that uh, the business works in the here and now, and that we at the foundation decided to work on there and then in the long term, pursuing to solve problems from the roots through social investments. Our three lines of actions that you can see here are sustainable development, early childhood development, and arts and culture. And I will talk a little bit more about this. Uh, we decided to connect with the social investment world, a world that philanthropy is moving to a new place and is hiring visionaries. It's hiring people and organizations with a long-term vision committed to give it all for the world always with a, with a strategy and bringing collective action, collaboration, innovation, and the potential of a scale at the front of all our decisions. So following on, on what uh, Sophie and, and Caroline just shared with us, I will share how are we, how, how we have been adapting even before knowing your full study, uh, how we, we have been aligning our efforts to the different lines of action. So starting with the business alignment, I will share our uh, Por el Futuro. And this is a collaboration with Coca-Cola Company and Coca-Cola FEMSA that we started uh, over a decade ago, uh, aware that uh, we could not only contribute to the nature, but also help our business to mitigate risks such as water shortages and to contribute to the availability of the water. So, so far we have given back to uh, our nature over uh, 6.7 million cubic meters uh, of water in these five countries in Latin America. If I move to industry alignment, um, then with the Inter-American Development mm -hmm. Bank, with the Nature Conservancy, the, the Global Environment Facility, and also the International Climate Initiative, we founded the Latin American Water Funds. Why this? Because we truly believe that we can and need and must contribute to water security in our region through the creation and expansion of water funds. And we started asking um, inside uh, our corporation, what would happen if a disruption happened in the hydric or natural systems? And what would be our role as, as private sector? And we were really aware of the need of putting this long-term vision, the systems, the methodologies, and all the capacities that the private sector has to contribute to something that is not only relevant to our environment, but also to our social development and the whole system that includes the health, the water, the energy, the food, among others. So, uh, so far we have 31 funds 
in nine countries. And what is relevant is, is that we are not only funding in FEMSA territories, but also in other territories that need these kind of interventions. And because we truly, and also we have funds of competitors because we truly believe that this is pre-competitive. We can compete in the business sector, in the economic uh, world, but the society is uh, for all of us and for that reason, we should also share and uh, collaborate in this in this side. If we go to a thematic alignment from the societal angle, this is materially important to the company. And we have been investing in educational and social development for over 100 years. So uh, this is uh, this just shows how important this is for us. Uh, we adopted early childhood development and culture as also two of our thematic um, uh, of our causes. And why we did this, uh, we truly believe that we need to invest in the next generation. And this means if we need to take different decisions in the next 30 years to, to bring the sustainability of the world, we need to invest when this uh, businessmen and these leaders and politicians are between their zero and six years old, which is now. So we have three lines of actions here. We invest in resilience communities, in family friends, friendly policies, in corporations, and also in public policy, because we believe that policies can and need to be designed and redesigned, put it chill, putting children at the center of our decisions. Everything in our world runs, uh, runs around adults, and we are not aware of the consequences of not investing in the first six years of life of the children of our world. And with uh, the same commitment, we have uh, invested uh, for over 36 years in culture in Latin America. We own one of the biggest uh, collections of culture um, of Latin American art of the 20th and 21st century. But we also are promoting emerging artists, promoting access to culture through uh, uh, traveling exhibitions and through our biannual, which is going to take place in the 14th edition this next October. We'll be moving to the digital world, so we would love to share you about this so you can live and be part of our next piano. And um, in in the last but not least um, uh, side of our of the way that we are uh, contributing, uh, focusing on this um, uh, classification of non-material alignment, Juntos por la Salud, uh, which means Together for Health, shows how we as FEMSA have enhanced our ability to create social ch uh, change. Our chairman, Jose Antonio Fernandez, founded this initiative in the context of this pandemic last uh, March, jointly with one of the largest banks in Mexico and, and, and in many other places in the world, Bancom BBVA, and also with the foundation of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, Fundación UNAM, and one of the leading research organizations in the field of health, which is Fonsalud. Its central strategy is to concentrate efforts to prevent and reduce COVID-19 contagion with a priority focus on, first, preventing first-line heroes, which are doctors, nurses, and health personnel, as well as Mexican security forces from becoming infected. And also, in the second line of action, strengthening the capacities of the country's hospital and human infrastructure. So far, this initiative has joined the collaboration of almost 600 companies and NGOs that have donated over $75 million to Mexican society to respond to this pandemic in an effective way. And in the right side, uh, um, I'm just showing one of the initiatives that we as Fundación FEMSA, as part of Juntos por la Salud, uh, push and, uh, and actually put together with uh, five other uh, companies and foundations from different sectors, from the, from entertainment, also banking and retail to uh, protect doctors and uh, health personnel in no COVID hospitals, uh, which is uh, this uh, sector of personnel that is working without knowing that uh, they can be uh, con um, 
suffering COVID. So, so far we have protected over 86,000 um, uh, health workers in uh, 185 hospitals. And this just shows one of the many efforts that we have done uh, in the context of this pandemic. And uh, this just shows how, um, and just to finalize, how real change happens at the speed of trust and collaboration. So thank you for listening and thank you for letting me share this with you. Thank you, Lore. Thank you. I think it's very interesting to see how you are implementing different alignments. Uh, and I, I'm sure that we'll have a lot of questions at the end of the Guillaume presentation. So I just want to give you the floor to you, Guillaume, and you will explain uh, how you are implementing these alignments and how do you see strategically the, 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 how you can implement them. Okay. Hi. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you to, to invite me. Uh, so I'm not going to present uh, the Renault Corporation because I guess uh, anybody knows we, we are a car maker. Obviously, we are present in uh, a few countries in Latin America, especially in Brazil, in Colombia, in uh, Argentina, and of course in Mexico as well. Um, I uh, I belong to the uh, CSR department, and uh, in, within the CSR department, we have different activities, among which uh, the, the social business activity, uh, which is split into three main uh, activities. The first one is what we call the Renault's uh, Garage Solidaire, uh, which are uh, an in-house uh, social business that we uh, launched uh, in 2012, uh, which is uh, an opportunity to pour people to make their, uh, to maintain and repair the car at a very low price. And uh, now for uh, uh, a bit more than two years now, they also can uh, lease a, a, a new, a brand new vehicle uh, at a very low price as well. The second uh, activity uh, is uh, the one I'm uh, responsible of, which is the Mobilize Invest uh, Investment Fund. Uh, I'm going to elaborate on afterwards. And the third one is, uh, let's say, the the the, the, the co-construction with all the uh, ecosystem, in, uh, especially in France, and especially with the academic uh, uh, world. Uh, like uh, with HEC, which is a the, the uh, a, a business school in in, in France. Um, Mobilize Invest was created in 2012. It's a uh, small um, impact uh, impact fund. Uh, when I say small, we are funded at uh, at the uh, uh, at, well, let's say around uh, five, uh, five million euros. Uh, the general principle uh, uh, is based on the, the, the social business principle. That is, we make no dividends and uh, no loss, and we, in, we invest all of our profits to maximize the social impact, obviously. Um, our uh, different criteria uh, is aimed at mobility because uh, we see mobility as a way to uh, to make people to to include people uh, to help them uh, to find uh, a new job, for instance, or to to to, to keep your, their their job. That's why we invest in structures, uh, mainly startups, that work in the uh, mobility uh, field. And of course, they have to uh, create a, a social impact that we will assess. And the third, the third criteria, of course, is the economic sustainability, uh, because of course we we once again we we don't want to. Uh, to get any dividends on or whatsoever, but we want to invest into a business that is uh, economically sustainable. Um, 
we invest in equity we also invest in debt and actually we mainly invest in debt uh for uh, where i would say um five year uh, five year uh, long uh, debt something like that the amount of uh, each ticket is between uh 50k and 1 million euros but uh let's say the average is 200k uh, per uh, per startup, and uh, we also offer uh, what we call tailor-made support, with the, uh, uh, which means that uh, beyond uh, the the uh, financial support, we also provide uh, uh, support through uh, what uh, people what, uh, that, uh, that we call mentors that are. Uh, Renault employees that will help the company uh, to uh, to develop. I will elaborate more uh, just afterwards. Here are a few examples of uh, different startups uh, we invested in. Uh, uh, they are mainly fields of uh, public services like car sharing uh, or carpooling, for instance but also uh, transportation for um, disabled people, uh, uh, bike sharing uh, as well, and also uh, digital. We have uh, um, road, uh, road safety uh, training software and uh, driving, uh, driving learning uh, so software as well. And the last uh, investment we made is Nino Robotics, which uh, who develops uh, electric uh, wheelchairs, uh, uh, very uh, affordable electric wheelchairs uh, for people uh, uh, that makes them uh, kind of proud to, 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 to use this kind of wheelchair because uh, obviously the design of the wheelchair is, is really appealing. I was mentioning the role of the mentor, which is uh, a, a, let's say, senior executive at Renault. Uh, and uh, the mentor will help the startup, uh, will challenge their business model, they challenge the strategy, they will help to find uh, new, new business opportunities, for instance. And uh, uh, the mentors are uh, really the link between Renault and, uh, and the startup itself, actually. Uh, we do that because, uh, uh, first of all, we are a very small team, so we can take care of uh, all the startups we invest in. But mainly we do that because we want to involve uh, as many empl Renault employees as possible, actually, because they, in that way, they become they become some kind of ambassadors inside Renault to uh, let everybody know what social business is inside Renault, actually. Uh, this uh, this scheme is is a bit maybe a bit tough to understand. And it's very connected to the French law. But, uh, however, I, I found it uh, interesting to present it uh, because I was, uh, like I was saying, uh, Renault um, Mobilized Invest is funded by uh, the Renault the Renault Corporation uh, for five millions euro, but we also get some money from uh, the Renault Employees Savings Plan actually uh, in front there is a law that allows um, what we call impact investing uh, to 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 be to be collected to be managed uh, by uh, by investment funds so we collect around a, a bit less than 10 percent of uh, this uh, uh, specific uh, saving plan uh, and we, it helps us to uh, to to, to 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 support uh, new projects, and the rest, the 90%, is uh, is managed by an asset manager, a classic asset manager, uh, and it's a sustainable uh, SRI, it's a sustainable uh, uh, investment. Um, we also measure our uh, the 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 impact. It's very 
of course, it's crucial to, 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 to measure the social impact, Gen both generated by the companies we invest in, uh, in and uh, also by uh, ourselves. Uh, it's been now uh, three years that we assess uh, the social impact uh, generated by uh, the 14 companies we, we've uh, invested in. And now this year, we, we started to also assess our own uh, social impact. I mean, social impact on all the stakeholders, uh, the, the, the renewed employees, the uh, people helped by the different startups and so on. And we defined a, a kind of a, a, a assessment canvas to measure uh, year after year uh, this uh, this uh, social impact. <clears throat> uh, as you can see, this is the result of uh, the social the, the consolidated uh, social impact of the different uh, uh, startups. Uh, it means that we 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 helped uh, let's say uh, more than uh, one uh, 155 thousand people uh, let's say let, let's say that were positively positively uh, affected by uh, our, our different startups um, we we help them either to uh, keep their job or to to get another job through uh, a mobility service, for instance. Uh, if I take the example of a uh, car sharing service, uh, if this service can can provide uh, very low prices for people uh, in search of a of a new job to uh, to to go to an interview, for instance, that that could help them uh, to 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 get this job. Um, we also uh, help, let's say, try to uh, help people to, to be more conscious of eco-mobility, uh, like uh, driving an electric car or uh, riding a bike and so on. Uh, and we also work with uh, a lot of uh, different uh, other uh, companies or associations or uh, different uh, impact funds. And it, this is really crucial for us because in that way we can, for instance, exchange our deal flows to, uh, uh, to know uh, new, new startups in the field of mobility, uh, for instance. And it, this is very helpful for our own, uh, uh, I, I mean, to, to, to be known, uh, so, so, so that uh, those startups can, can, can be sure that we could help them, for instance. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we are actually a, a very small, uh, small team. Uh, we do everything in-house. Actually, we are two people in charge of the, 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 the fund itself, and we are helped by uh, the corp uh, somebody from the corporate finance at Renault and somebody from the, the legal department as well. And uh, basically, that's it, uh, plus all the, the mentors I was uh, men previously mentioning as well. Uh, I think I'm done with my presentation to, to give time for questions, of course. Kiliaman, thank you very much for your presentation. And I think it's also very important to see how you are working with these alignments. So I will open this um, the next session for question and for questions from the audience. I have some questions. So one a general question is: What challenges do you face uh, applying these alignments? And for example, uh, Lore, you show us how you are trying to apply in different projects them and you Guillaume are more specific in one of them the business alignment so could you explain with us how you are seeing the challenges or so Lori thank you um, the challenges at, at the end are many but if we are not willing to face them uh, we are in the wrong place to to start with Secondly, um, 
I think that we need to support with our work creating social value in the long term at the end, uh, linking in how we can help our organizations mitigating risks is um, clearly really, really important to, because at the same time we're helping society, we are helping our organizations to understand that the only way to move forward as sustainable organizations is integrating the social value into it. So uh, uh, one of the main challenges is the communication because most of the time people see this divide. Either you are in the social sector, either you are in the economic sector. And, and the integration of both is, uh, from, from my perspective, is uh, um, still a challenge. And um, third, I would say uh, measuring impact. And that is a good guide and, and a good reference on how would you choose where to put your money and your resources and your time and all the ma machinery of the organization. Um, and, and most of the times, as we are in the social sector facing many uh, problems at the same time, we have difficulties choosing the right fight and we need to take that into, into our perspective. Guillaume. Well, um... The main challenge is uh, probably that, uh, first of all, the, uh, that uh, uh, we are a very small team and we uh, support more and more uh, startups. So that's uh, kind of, yeah, it's kind of difficult actually. Um, the, the, the other, uh, well, let's say the other challenge is probably uh, to be known inside Renault. And I would say that we are probably best known outside Renault because, uh, I mean, many um, impact funds or uh, uh, let's say impact uh, startups know us uh, outside Renault, but inside Renault, the Renault employees don't know us very well and don't even know that uh, Renault can be involved in the in, in such a, in, in such kind of business actually. Yes, it is something that happens to many other corporate foundations. <laughs> Do you want to add something from the EVP side, Stephen, Sophie, Caroline? Uh, how do you see the perspective and challenges when you when you analyze different perspectives and alignments? Do you see any specific challenge with any specific alignment or do you see that is something that is already in a, in a process? Yes, uh, I had probably a question for, for Guillaume because uh, in the case of Renault Mobilis, it's very interesting, as Renault mentioned, uh, Renault Mobilis is uh, uh, inside the corporate social and responsibility uh, team. So, um, uh, helicopter view, uh, as such, we can guess there is a converging narrative, and uh, this is why uh, Renault Mobilis is uh, within this group of sustainability. Uh, what about the challenges? Um, a question for you. Yeah. Um, well, actually, um, yes, it's. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that uh, yeah, it's important for us to be uh, to be within the CSR department and to be uh, let's say to be in the sustainable world inside Renault. Let's say, uh, uh, however, it's more important for us probably to be uh, really connected to the day-to-day -day business uh, to demonstrate that uh, it's not just for the image that we do that first. And it's not uh, also, uh, we, we, we try day by day to explain that social business means uh, business, obviously. I, I, what I mean is uh, we don't lose money or we try not to lose money, actually. Uh, we don't make Renault lose money. Uh, we, we try to make Renault, uh, let's say, uh, discover uh, new ways to, uh, to do business. And eventually, uh, the, the, uh, I mean, what we try to do is to transform 
all the company, not only the, the CSR department, of course, but we uh, our kind of mission is to transform all the company uh, to make people understand that uh, in their day day-to-day -day business, they can add a social part in their business, even if they work in marketing or engineering or manufacturing, or I, or I don't know. Uh, if they they think about if they think about uh, about it about, a bit differently, they can add a bit of social uh, social impact in their business, and what that's uh, our uh, let's say daily mission. Mm -hmm. so we see if, here if if, if yeah. I can sorry if I can add maybe as well, um, it is complex indeed as we see, but what we see is those that at least get some focus and streamlining between all those initiatives is the companies that have a guiding star we can call it purpose we can call it a dot on the horizon but if philip says my guiding star is creating access to affordable health care then you can see how the company or the foundation or the grant making facility or the loan facility they can all contribute to this higher purpose the same for danon it is one planet, one health. So if you have that clear kind of conception that you take your company be beyond your transactional supply chain, that's where you have the guiding star. Second, it's early days. We're all exploring how those multiple pieces of the puzzle can come together. We're still puzzling. We don't have the silver bullet. We don't have the final answer. But as you've seen in, in some of those very nice examples that if you progress and you see the value, the complementarity of each of them, then you're moving forward. Probably in three to five years time, we will have more concrete advice on how they kind of uh, join forces alongside each other. Sophie, did you want to add something else? You were talking. Yeah, no, I, I, I just uh, it, um reflecting on the uh, on the Guillaume's, Guillaume's uh, answer uh, in this case we clearly see uh, in the case of the, the business alignment that the company is really uh, an impact accelerator uh, really and uh, um, that uh, the, the team is, is definitely uh, uh, dedicated to um, yeah uh, transform contribute to transform the traditional business into more uh, sustainable and more inclusive business definitely yes and i like what you are saying Stephen, about that is not a, a one alignment that we want to implement say this is better than the other one i think because one of the question is for loren you know, is if you have to choose just one alignment for your company i think it's not just choosing one alignment i think it's how you can implement and account you can align with the strategy of the company and give more value added to the to the ecosystem and also to the stakeholders of the company beyond of saying i, I need to choose one i think it's not the the intention of of this corporate social initiative it's how you can present and how you can take advantage of them and how you can understand better your projects with applying this kind of of alignments as Lori show us that they are implementing different alignments in different projects and how they are at the end they are aligned with this the, the corporate strategy um so true caro if i if i can add yes, something uh it is really true what you are saying and in our case we have uh gone if i could say in from all the efforts where have we invested the most i could say from the four we have been in the middle like more thematic more industry alignment and the only reason is because of there is action collective action is where collective action at the most and 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 from that we have been moving in in the different cases but it's uh situational sometimes but we want to be where innovation is where scalable projects are where uh collective action is so mm. We will move in that direction. It's the project. I think that uh, we are on the ground. This is what we hear from the practitioners. It's the projects who are driving, driving the the, the strategic alignment journey. The yes, and I think, and I think it's not only the, the alignment. It's also using different vehicles. For example, funds, accelerators. It's not using the foundation as the only vehicle to 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 implement 
the, the corporate strategies, how you can use them. So one of the questions that in the chat here for you, Lori, is about that. If you can tell us more about defense uh, ventures, is how it's related with the strategy. From yeah, Rodolfo sure. Sagadon. Sure. Well, uh, the FEMSA ventures are a fairly new and they were uh, from FEMSA, we are pushing boundaries and we are furthering innovation from that side. So it's something that is still in the process of growing and but certainly will be an amazing mechanism to further to, to pursue innovation in the way we are seeing it with more integration to the business as well. Okay, so we have three minutes left. I just want to invite you, all of you to share with the audience just in one minute, or maybe less, a reflection. If you are here and we have a lot of corporations asking, okay, what is the best alignment? How I can improve my strategy? Just a brief reflection to share with the audience. I can only, I just opened the polls. Do you believe Latin Paco should replicate the corporate social initiative? 100% yes. <laughs> so, what else to say, Katerina? <laughs> That's great. It's how we can continue improving our time. So, welcome. I, we are delighted that we can do that and delighted to work with you, with the VPA, and learn from you. So, Sophie, Caroline, Lore, Guillaume. If I may uh, say, uh, I just celebrate that Europe and Latin America are more together than ever through this initiative and we are proud to be part of it. So thank you and this is going to be great for both regions. Caroline, I think you should say something in Spanish. <laughs> oh, bueno, uh, no, <laughs> I'm a bit too nervous, I think. Uh, no, but I think my my last reflection would be that I think we're indeed all on this journey together, and I think it's important to also look at alignment as not an end in itself, but as a means towards enhancing your social impact. So think about where can you really make the most additional social impact by choosing an alignment. And I think that would be my final remark. And again, of course, the collaboration spirit which is a, a great and needed. Thank you, Caroline. Sophie, mm -hmm. Gilan. Yeah, um, I think that um, it's definitely a journey, as uh, Caro just, just mentioned. It's a, it's a journey, ongoing journey. Um, and uh, we, we were very happy over the past years to see that the resources we developed were very useful to the corporate social investors to educate the top management, because as long as the top management is not well aware as a clear understanding of the strategic uh, opportunities and challenge for opportunities for its own business, uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's a challenge for the corporate social investors, the foundation, to be enough empowered. So we would be delighted to share those resources uh, uh, and to um, to share that uh, with uh, with you, uh, Carolina, in Latin America. Thank you, Sophie Guillaume. Well, I would say that uh, for old and, uh, and huge companies such as Renault, the main challenge is transformation. I mean, we don't have any choice. We, we, we know that we cannot uh, sell cars uh, that we, the, the, the way we did uh, in, in, the fast, in the last uh, years. Uh, so we have to transform ourselves. And uh, of course, for a huge company like us, Sometimes it's difficult, uh, but I would say that uh, impact investing is probably uh, one way for, uh, for one tool for innovation. So uh, thank you very much for everybody uh, at EVPA and Latin Pacto, because we, we need uh, uh, your support and your uh, new ideas and so on uh, to, well, to reinvent ourselves, actually. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, and, and thank you for being here with us. Yes, uh, we ha I have a lot of questions regarding the, we will share the presentations. Yes, we will share the presentations, the recording link, and also some takeaways. And we will ask the question that we can we couldn't address during the, the webinar. And just to finish, uh, an invitation to the uh, 16 EVPA annual conference that will take place at the end of September, so you can register now. I uh, will have a... Um, uh, we will have also a, a session focused in Latin America, how we can leverage connections and knowledge from Latin America and who can engage better with the European 
community and also uh, we will have our uh, first online course on fundamentals on uh, investing for impact and we will apply all the learnings from our EDPA uh, network, our sister network. So um, once again, thank you for joining us today and looking forward to continue in touch. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Muy bien. Thank you, Lore, Sophie, thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Un abrazo y hasta Muy pronto. Complicada. Un abrazo. Muy... Muy obrigado. Un abrazo. Bye bye.